For Kremo Media's Policy, I'm Sashni Madli. Joining me today is author and business journalist TJ Stradom, here to unpack his book, Capitec, Stalking Giants. What initially drew you to Capitec's story and made you believe it was an important story to tell? Capitec is probably the biggest success story in South Africa that hasn't been properly told. Uh, and that's the reason I, I found it interesting. And also because it's a financial institution and a bank, but it's different from from other banks. I, I remember early on walking into a branch, it just looked like a, a doctor's waiting room and not really like a bank. And uh, I wanted to interrogate that and, and see why they did that, how it's benefited them. Uh, and, you know, if a, if a business grows from 2001 to having basically zero savings clients to having 23 million uh, in 2024, that's a massive growth story and a success story, and I wanted to unpack that. So that's that's the reason I chose Capitec. It's an unauthorized story, so I did my did my own research and my own thing, um, and and I found that amazing because the uh, the story is really that interesting. Capitec is often described as a challenger brand to the traditional banking giants. What do you think were the key factors that allowed Capitec to achieve such rapid growth in this difficult market? So I think they understood their clients very well, uh, and it was an underserviced market. They were the first bank to really go and sit down with people uh, at the desk and talk to them about their financial needs. And I th think if you look at the early 2000s, the middle 90s, that didn't really happen. So, so they understood client needs, and they understood that also you can solve many of those problems just with basic banking products, but your delivery has to be good. It has to be very, very quick. It has to be efficient. It has to be complex in the back, but simple for the consumer when they see it. And I think that's where they, they really found, um, at first it was a niche, and then it grew into you know something bigger and bigger because you know, for six years or so, they spent hardly anything on marketing. But by the time they, they took out their first ad, they had more than a million clients. So that shows you that by word of mouth, their business model and, and, and the way that they approach client needs in banking really spread around and, and, and people started taking notice and, um, and opening accounts. So they could position themselves as a cheaper, quicker alternative to, let's say, the, the, the old big giants. Uh, and that really gave them a foothold, which they then consolidated. And over a period of 20 years, they became massive just because they had this compound growth and this great story of, of being different from the rest. In the book, you highlight the importance of innovation in Capitec rise. What were some of the most significant innovations that helped Capitec differentiate itself from established banks? What's interesting about Capitec is they... You wouldn't say they were at the forefront of technology, but they certainly used the best available and affordable technology for them at the time, and they implemented that. And to me, it seemed everything had a, had a purpose. So they would certainly try to do things as quick as possible. And they, they thought for their clients, that was the best way to do it. So that was part of the reason why they went paperless and part of the reason why they used things like web cameras and fingerprint recognition very early on. But I think they, they also, and you know, innovation is not always the most expensive, newest form of technology. I think they tried to solve the problem from first principles. They looked at it not as bankers, but they looked at it as people, some of them were from retail and from tech retail. So they wanted to see what, what people really wanted and how best to implement that. So for them, the layout didn't, didn't have to look like a bank branch. They thought, Yes, let people look at the same screen at the same time. Whereas in, a, in, a, in other bank branches, you had a teller that looked at the computer screen and that teller would tell you, well, listen, sorry, you're not allowed to get a loan or we can't open this account or we can't solve this problem for you. And I think that, that made them think differently. And just because uh, they could do that, they could accelerate a lot of other things. So I think the, the innovation was often sort of a process innovation. They thought this is the quicker way of delivering this service, and this is a way that we can make it cheaper for the client and for ourselves. Um, and, and I think 
that really benefited them. Um, later on, yes, there were some innovations in, in some of the products that they offered. But remember, initially, for about 15 years, it was a single savings account, a single global one card, a gold card that everyone had, and some very simple loan options. So, yeah, the, the innovation is an interesting story because I think it shows you that you don't need the most advanced technology at all times to innovate. You need to think about what, what the businesses you're trying to build and then see how best to put technology into certain parts of that system. And then in the end, you get a result that is much quicker, much more efficient than, than your competitors, just because you thought about the problem from first principles. Now, as you've mentioned, Capitec's model was built around simplicity and transparency. Just tell us a bit more about how the company ensured that its products remained easy to understand for its target audience, especially in a country with a diverse and often financially underserved population. Yeah, so the interesting thing is the executives did plenty of branch visits. Um, if you talk to the CEO now, Harry Furi, he said that he signed off the first 600, 650 branches after having visited those branches themselves, walked the streets, had a look at where the taxi rank is, where the ATM is positioned compared to um, the bank, where the bank is positioned compared to the retailers. Uh, and, you know, I think immersing yourself in the experience of the client in that way made a big difference for Capitec from, from early on. And they had some, some learnings from their micro-lending routes because they, they started off as a distribution uh, system of 300 micro-lenders. And I think the client interaction that you saw in those micro-lending branches really informed uh, Capitec as to the needs of their banking clients and the financial needs of, you know, of many people who had never before used financial services in South Africa. It's an interesting question to try to answer. But I think it definitely goes back to the executives being in direct contact with the clients. Now, like your book says, and like you just said, leadership at Capitec has been central to its growth. Can you discuss the role of the company's leadership in driving the company's vision and culture a bit more? So that's a very, uh, it's a very good question, but it's a question that's very difficult to answer because you obviously never know what the internal workings is of a company um, when you write an unauthorized book. Uh, like I have. But, you know, from looking at 20 years worth of annual reports, speaking to lots of the management team themselves, to me, the thing that stood out is uh, Capitec's focus on solving specific problems. So now I have a chapter in the book that is just called Focus. And it just basically says that the, the management tried to do a few things very, very well. And only when they really mastered that would they move on to either another product line or a, a, a new business unit or more recently they've, they've actually acquired some companies and started building out a business bank. But they really wanted to get retail banking down. So a simple savings account by focusing on that. Um, they had opportunities to sell other financial products in their branches for many years and they just decided not to do that because they said, we are going to focus on this probably get to a, a large market share. And I think internally they talk about 30% market share before they actually move on to something else. And I think definitely that focus. And then part of the focus is also focusing on the, on the client and the client's needs. And, you know, I've mentioned it before. This is something that we're really good at because they, they got into contact with the clients and they, they really had conversations from the highest level but with real clients in their branches. And I, and I think this is something that's not common in the banking sector and specifically not in the early 2000s. And I, I don't know as a, as a client whether you've ever run into the CEO of your bank in a branch. I assume not. I don't think it's common. And what do you think traditional banks underestimated about Capitec's approach? And how have they since responded to the competition that Capitec poses? So I think traditional banks didn't know that Capitec could function at such a low cost as they did. So internally, Capitec's cost was low, but also the, the services that they gave to their clients was at a very low cost and very aggressive. I mean, 
they talk about never launching a product if it's not at least 40 or 50 percent cheaper than anything uh, offered by the opposition so i think the bigger banks probably either didn't take notice of capitec at all or where they did they sort of thought well this is not sustainable they they simply cannot do it that cheaply but again that goes back to the designing their branches designing their their whole distribution platform to be scalable and to be you know clever with, with technology not ne necessarily have the poshest thing uh, newest gadget in every branch but to have things that suit their their needs and and if you look over the years maybe around 2007 2009 um, other financial uh, institutions started taking notice of capitec but you know the real fight back against capitec it sort of started in those years but it was very difficult because the the other banks still thought in a older way about or uh, they thought about um the way you think about checks and the, they, 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 their approaching was with an old form of banking. So they had to make their cost structure work for that. And unfortunately, you know, Capitec just came in much cheaper um, because they never had a check account and they never had checks and they never had the risk associated with checks or the paper based system that you need to support that. And I think because of that for, for many years, they could reinvest in just getting their system to move and work more like a machine. So by the early 2010s and by the mid 2010s, it was almost impossible to stop Capitec or to compete with Capitec when it comes to the costs of their system. And, and the other banks had these massive legacy systems in terms of uh, IT infrastructure. So someone like Standard Bank spent something like 5 billion a year on trying to upgrade their system, whereas you know, Capitec famously said they built their whole bank for 300 million rand. Mm -hmm. But so the difference there in cost is so massive that I think the big banks never thought they were actually as expensive as they are in terms of what customers pay for, clients pay for. And I think they never thought anyone could do it that much cheaper. And what do you believe were the key turning points that solidified Capitec's position in the markets? So Capitec had a genius marketing spurt in 2009, where they wrote themselves into, into the storyline of a soapy. Um, I think that's, that's a chapter that, that anyone who's interested in marketing should read. Um, so that was, let's say, maybe it's not a, it wasn't a turning point, it was a step change in, in the way that the market perceived them. And um, I think the, the next big, the big event in their life was when their biggest rival in unsecured lending, African Bank, actually did not survive. They, uh, they went under in 2014 and, you know, reemerged years later, but in a very different format. Um, so I think Capitec benefited from, uh, from, from that to a great extent. So that, while not a turning point, it was definitely they could change the way they see the market and how they how they approach the market because they were then the market leaders in unsecured lending. It was clear that the bigger banks, the or the more traditional banks, they also saw that as an opportunity because very quickly First National Bank came into that market and, and became Capitec's biggest competitor in unsecured loans. Um, so I think I think that event definitely. And then I think where Capitec really cemented the image as a, a type of a South African champion was when the uh, Viceroy report came out in 2018 that made certain allegations about Capitec's business model, about the bank, and the way that their management team then responded to that Viceroy report. Um, you know, banks are all about confidence and about trust. So if the response was unclear then or, or was not convincing, it could cause something like a run on the bank. And, you know, that didn't happen just because they took it really seriously. They took the allegations seriously. They tried to answer all of them immediately. And then management split into two and the operational guys ran the bank and the CEO and CFO 
literally went and saw almost everyone they could to convince them of what the business case of the bank is. So I think that in terms of the image and uh, their status as a, as a large, solid South African financial institution, I think that did them a, a big favor in a way. So again, maybe not a turning point, but almost an acceleration. And lastly, TJ, what do you hope readers take away from the story of Capitec? Are there specific lessons or insights you believe are most crucial for businesses, entrepreneurs, or policymakers? Yeah, so I think the, the biggest takeaway from Capitec is that an industry and uh, an economy can change very quickly. And I say very quickly, relatively quickly. But you think it'll take 100 years for a big company or big bank to emerge. It took Capitec basically a decade. Then they were of a certain size um, and two decades in. They are seriously disrupting what the financial landscape in South Africa looks like. If they really make a success of insurance, which is something they're moving into now, they could disrupt giants like Sunlum and Old Mutual. If they make a success of business banking, not only could they disrupt the traditional four banks and, and their business banking offerings, but they could potentially change the way that small businesses operate in South Africa and, and the way they use financial services. So, you know, the big takeaway is sometimes you just need to let the private sector run with something and see what they can do. And I think Capitec is a perfect example where a number of innovative guys with some capital. So the founding um, management team, half of them came from the liquor industry. They brought learnings from another um, field into financial services. The Capitec they got from a very entrepreneurial and very risk on team at uh, PSG. And um, they then maneuvered the, the regulatory environment in South Africa and matched client need to what they could offer. So I think it's possible, and this is what people should take away from it, policymakers and everyone, it's possible to build successful businesses in South Africa. It's possible that those businesses actually do good. There's a, a, a report out from the University of Johannesburg that estimates the positive effect of Capitec entering the market in South Africa is 20 billion rand in the consumer's pocket every year because it drove down banking costs and some finance costs. That's how consumers benefited. So a bank can make proper profits and they can you know, employ people, and they can actually be good for the consumer. And that's all because people wanted to do something very efficiently, where there were inefficiencies at some of, some of the established players. So the micro lending industry started because of a small exemption on the Usury Act in the 1990s, and it created a whole new world for financial services in South Africa that needed to be formalized, and Capitec was at the forefront of formalizing that and turning themselves into a bank that then actually benefited lots of consumers. And hopefully, hopefully the story is not over yet, um, because I would like to write a follow-up book in a few years about the financial services giant Capitec, not the, um, the emerging banking giant. That was author and business journalist TJ Stradom discussing his book, Capitec, Stalking Giants.